Okay. Do you want me to be the timekeeper, uh, Rich? Sure, that, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I can do that. So we have a um, multiple guests here today for, and I, for public comment. So if folks want to have public comment, would they please raise their hands and I can unmute them? A little raise hand feature. I don't see anyone raising their hand. Okay. Oh, Liz, hold on one second. Oh, I got another person to let in. Okay. Maybe just say that one more time. Yeah, does anyone want to make public comment? They could raise their hand, it would be great. I will be more than happy to unmute them if they can't unmute themselves already. If there's a topic people are interested in that's not on, especially if it's not on our agenda, um, now's the time. Right. So, okay, great. So moving along. Um, Wait, there's one hand, Rich. Whoop, where? I don't. It's oh, Liz. It's, no, Got it? Right. Oh, that's funny. Oh. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't look carefully at the agenda. Um, it is, are, is the issue of the cherry trees on Warfield Place going to be discussed at this meeting today? That, that is not, it's not on our, not on our agenda list. Um, well, I, I would like to discuss it. So you, you're more than welcome to have public comment if you have comments to give to the commission. Okay, um, actually, I would like to cede my time to Katie Young. Okay, I haven't seen Katie. I'm not, I will find Katie, so. Hi, Katie. Hey, how's it going, Rich? Um, I, I just, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand what, so if, like, when decisions are made about a street, like, at what point could someone intervene or, or have a say? Like, I guess I'm just trying to figure out, like, I'm trying to be participatory. Um, I'm trying to, like, you know, get my opinion about Warfield Place out there. And I, I think the other guests probably are too. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems like maybe if this meeting isn't when people talk about it, then that's not, you know, the, the correct uh, thing to do. I, I don't know. I guess I'm just trying to figure out, is it even appropriate for me to talk about Warfield right now and raise any concerns? Oh. Or will it sort of do nothing and this isn't the right place to do it? So, uh, so typically, I I don't make we're not allowed. We're not supposed to make public. We're not supposed to interrupt public comment, folks. But I will tell you that the Urban Forestry Commission um, is is an advisory group. So the decisions made on Warfield Place are are and those are the decisions that are made, um, at the administrative level, which would be um, the DPW, as we've talked about in the past, and also um, the mayor's office. Okay, um, I guess then my, my comments I'll, I'll keep more general, um, which um, which are just that I feel like Warfield Place is and, and what's happening on it now, regardless of how it turns out, is really functioning as a lesson um, that maybe the Urban Forestry Commission needs more power, perhaps needs more independence. Um, it's been really frustrating for us to see the Sustainable Northampton Plan and the Complete Streets Plan, which as I'm sure you all know, really clash with each other in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating to see to see those um, uh, really ignored by the city and by the DPW. And it's, it's frustrating that there seems to be such a disconnect between the Urban Forestry Commission and the DPW. 
and uh, just as a citizen of Northampton, um, it's been it's been shocking how how difficult it is to get our opinion regarding trees or sustainability or anything to uh, to the city. So I don't know if it's a matter of of you all having having more power, or more independence, or something like that. But I, I wanted to raise that as a as a structural issue um, because it's a big frustration for for us, and I think maybe we don't necessarily know how to advocate for it as citizens. Thank you. Anything else to add before we move on to our agenda? Um, thank you. We'll, we'll take your we'll take your comments and concerns uh, clearly under uh, under advisement um, and give them serious consideration. Thank you. Um, so, uh, for moving on from public comment, um, we have uh, review and approve the minutes of six two twenty twenty one. I don't know if folks had a chance to read them. I sent them out over the, I think on sun, on Sunday. Or sometime I, I have one, uh, just a typo on the second page under summer internship, the third diamond bullet point. It says um, the goal of pollinate Northampton is to assist homeowners who want to support pollinators by, it should be planting native and it's plating. There's just an N missing there. Sorry. No big deal. Other than that, I didn't. But looks good to me. I make a motion to accept the meeting minutes of, I'm sorry, I keep changing screens for the date. Oh, of um, dated June 2nd, 2021. I'll second. Any discussion on the motion? Sorry, no discussion. We have roll call vote, please, Deb. Gladly. So Rich? Yes. Susan? Yes. Jen? Yes. Molly? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. David? Yes. Sorry. I think that's it. Okay. I'm missing anybody else. If there's anybody else there. You got everybody. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Sorry. It's all right. Okay. Um, so it's been quite a while since we last met as a whole group. Um, we've had one sub right group meeting. I started calling your work around 4.30, but I didn't already left. Um, we have, uh, we did, uh, Jen, Warner, myself, and Rob did meet as a subgroup uh, to discuss the Wood Bank. Um, and I, Jen, I apologize, I didn't get to put the minutes together for us to approve as a group um, for this meeting, but I'll get it done for next time. And um, let's see, I, I, uh, it's been a lot going on, obviously. Um, as uh, as uh, Katie um, alluded to, um, minutes ago about the Warfield Place issue, you know, I, I have um, been, uh, yesterday I actually went down and, and had some conversations with some folks on Warfield, Katie um, and um, Liz and um, the gentleman um, Oliver that lived next door and I'm working with them and other residents on the street to actually um, put together a planting plan um, to replace um, the trees uh, that will uh, most likely be removed Due to, the, due to the construction and actually hopefully retreat the other side of the street as well that has no overhead wires. So I'm trying to actively work with them to try to mitigate um, this uh, the, um, issue of the tree loss. Go ahead. Yes, Sue. I have a question. Uh, will there be large, will, will there be space for large shade trees that will actually shade, create a canopy for that street? 
So to, tomorrow I'm going to go down and, and actually measure that side of the street that has no overhead wires and try to figure out the tree, the stock of plant material that's in that tree belt already and try to uh, cite the appropriate planting locations for those types of medium sized trees. I think medium probably would be more appropriate given I don't think we want a 120 foot tall tulip. <laughs> It would be pretty cool, but. Um, and I have a second question. Is yeah. there any way, um, are residents interested? Is there any way even maybe with setbacks to replace a row of cherry trees and give them adequate root volume so that they won't run into the problems? So what, um, that's a good question. And where the cherry trees exist presently, the plan is to actually uh, remove them and replace them. Uh, the soil volume in the tree belt and underneath the sidewalk with structural soil. And also to uh, provide permeable sidewalk pavement like porous pave of some nature or flexi pave. So those cherry trees will actually have more rooting volume. The new ones will have more rooting volumes or whatever underwire trees are selected will have more volume than the existing trees do. So they will actually hopefully um, grow very quickly and um, have, a long, have a long life there. Uh, as far as the setbacks go, um, there are definitely some locations on um, the, the, I guess the dog leg right of Warfield where it comes out onto Finn Street. There's a there's two pretty sizable lawns there that don't have any uh, tree canopy whatsoever, but the right of way on Warfield, from what I understand, is very narrow, so we don't really own a lot on the other side of the on the other side of the curb there. There's no sidewalk there, so. I need to investigate that and communicate with the, the property owners and um, hopefully with, with help from the other residents on the street to, to try to encourage folks to allow some setbacks because that would be ideal. There's nice lawn size there and there's definitely no shading. They also, if you recall, they built a house at the corner of Warfield and Finn, which is a, it's a white, it was a house there they took it down and they built a newer building. Um, they had a tree in the corner of, of Warfield and Finn was a Norway maple, I believe, that was healthy and provided a bunch of benefits, but that tree is gone and has not been replaced. So, um, yes, Molly. Could you just clarify for me, is the plan for Warfield Place to um, uh, to put the shade, put bigger shade trees on one side, the, the opposite side where the cherry trees are now, and also to replace cherry trees on the side where they are now? That, that is like the, the, the framework that I'm working in. You know, that, that's the framework that I have, but I, I really want to work with the residents to get this, yeah. get this one right. Okay. So I, you know, I, I want to, there's, other, there's a, other issues there regarding sidewalk accessibility and et cetera that all needs to sort of be looked at um, as part of the, the larger tree planting aspect of it. So again, I, I'm trying to, I want to work with the residents and try to get this um, right away as best as possible. I'm really glad that you're working with them. Well, I well I am too, and I'm glad I went there yesterday to tie up the ginkgo trees to get them prepped for the tree protection that will happen eventually. And um, luckily, Katie and Liz were, were both home, so it was uh, it was nice to meet with them and, and all of our. Oh, Katie has raised her hand. So go ahead, Katie. I think you can unmute yourself. Go ahead. I can. I don't. Sorry, I didn't know if it was appropriate to talk to this one or not. Okay, cool. Yeah, we've had some great conversations with Rich. Um, I think it's it's really frustrating because our sense has been like the mayor sort of he posted the original plan, which shows the row of 10 trees being replaced by two, for example. He posted that on his Facebook page just three days ago, and he's it felt to us like he was doubling down. Um, he hasn't shown any willingness to work with the residents. He told us when we had a meeting with him that our neighborhood doesn't matter. Um, it's been incredibly unresponsive, um, as has Donna, and uh, it's been it's been really frustrating. So I'm glad that Rich is willing to work with the residents, but I, I guess I will say that at this point, I I think I speak for for others in saying that there's not a ton of good faith. So I think that maybe actually having a meeting with lots of people before the construction starts, or presenting as and I've already told Rich this. And or, or presenting us with an alternative plan that we could actually give some feedback on before, again, before the construction starts, would really restore that good faith. I think when people want to feel like they're being worked with, not, you know, 
that they have a plan put upon them. And I know that your purview is like, is the trees and that you work with people all the time. I mean, I've planted trees with you all. Um, wow. So, but I just sort of wanted to say that I think there's been enough bad faith and frustration generated that th there needs to be a, a bit of time for, for actual collaboration um, and, uh, and more information for the, for the residents, frankly, we don't know. And the trees could be, as far as we know, the trees could be coming down every day. I wake up every day and think, oh my God, is that a lawnmower or a chainsaw and freak out. Mm -hmm. um, and I just don't feel like that's how the residents should be living right now. They should be excited mm -hmm. about a city project and instead they're totally dreading it. I mean, I, it's hard to express how a riot's gone. Um, and I love the Urban Forestry Commission and I know it's not your, your all's fault that this is happening. Um, but I do think it's very important to express that this isn't, kind of just your average project at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, well, I mean, I, I really don't have anything else to, to add um, other than we've all been watching our rain and the weather has been crazy. Um, I don't have any really updates. And Rob's not here, so there's really no updates on our tree planting, which you all know was suspended back in May because it was too hot and too dry. Well, now it's super wet and very humid and sticky. Um, so um, I don't I don't really have much more to report from the, from the tree warden end of things. Unless anyone has any other questions for me. So I will turn it over to Kaylee. And yeah. I owe Kaylee an email that I didn't get to today and I'm really sorry and I hope this doesn't mess up what you're gonna try to talk about. Uh no, it's okay. I included some of the questions that I asked you. So if you can answer them now or you can open it to other people. Do mm -hmm. uh, I have the ability to share my screen? So I put together a PowerPoint of things mm -hmm. I've been doing. Let me make you a, a Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I just put together a like short presentation on the projects I've been working on. Um, I've been doing like a few small things, but in general, these are some of the like bigger PowerPoint presentations that I've been working on. Um, and the two main ones, so the first one is the public right of way presentation. And I met with um, David and Molly on Monday and we talked about um, this one and one other one. Um, and so I think this presentation is mainly used to inform people uh, like in terms of like trees that are either on their yard or like whether they're in the public right of way or not. Um, and then all, that also goes along with like whose ownership of the tree is it? And so who has to take care of it? And we've been getting a lot of feedback because I've met with a bunch of different people um, about this presentation, but we had uh, one question that I have on the next slide. So this is um, a slide from this presentation here. Um, and I know one we've, we've kind of put together this strategy of how to determine um, where the right of way ends. So how do you know where, um, if a tree is in the right of way or not in the right of way? And we have this question that I, I did um, email to Rich and it was kind of, how exactly can we find out the width of the right of way of a certain street? Because that's essentially what this like um, process of finding out the where the right of way ends is based on. And so I know, I think when we met with Molly from the DCR, it was, she kind of told us that it's like very hard to exactly find out what the width of the right of way is. So I was wondering if anyone had any idea of where like uh, anyone could go to find this information. If someone has that information, I wish they would share it with me because I haven't found it yet. Okay. I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but it's the yeah. truth. Um, Northampton's a very old city. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple um, different street widths for every single street, given the fact that it's so urbanized and so rural at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's no um, database or repository that one person could go to from the general public and access that information. Mm -hmm. The best thing you could do is try to go to the Registry of Deeds, but that requires a, a lot of uh, research. Okay. So it's easier for people just to email me and ask, and I can find okay just takes time. Okay, yeah. I think that was definitely one of the big questions we've had when working through this presentation. And then also just to like add, if anyone wants um, access to any of these presentations, I 
you can just email me and I can give anyone access if they want to look them over to, or if they have any suggestions as well. Um, and so then uh, one of the next presentations um, I've been working on, uh, the right away one in the summer tree care one have been like the main ones I've been working on. We've been meeting with people about them. And so this is kind of just um, should be based on um, as a guide for volunteers who are helping out um, to care for trees. And then there were a few questions um, that I have for this one that anyone um, can answer as well. Um, so we kind of, the way we broke this presentation down, it has six steps of what volunteers should do. And the first one is taking a picture of the tree they're initially working on and also to include um, the location address of the tree. And when I met with David and Molly, we talked about, or we were all just kind of wondering like, what is exactly is the purpose of this picture? What is it going to be used for just so we can um, inform the volunteers? So I wasn't sure if anyone uh, knew the answer to that question. Uh, Kaylee, could I just uh, just interrupt and, and ask the other commissioners, has, has everybody seen the Summer Tree Care slide deck? Would it, would it be helpful to go through it? Would you like to see it? Is there? Yeah. I can. Okay. I can pull it up and we can. Sorry, I didn't know we were taking pictures. Is and Rob isn't here, and he's really runs all of our volunteer, you know, procedures. Well, he's in charge of them, really. Yeah, I wasn't sure if this was Rob. Rob has treat. worked a lot on the safety aspects, but. Um, I can go through the summer tree care presentation and also the right of I one if, and if we have time at the end, because those are the main ones I've been working on. They're like, I guess, most completed compared to the other ones, which are still, um, I, I would definitely say drafts. So um, I can go through the summer tree care one right now, if that's okay with everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. All right. All right, so like I said before, this is more just um, directed at volunteers who are um, volunteering their time to help out. Through um, Tree Northampton, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so this is the first two slides are more just introductory slides, um, introducing someone to this volunteer work. Um, it talks about who you'll see in the materials that'll be around when they arrive picture of an earlier planning. And then, so these were kind of the six steps we talked about. So first it would be document the tree's condition, which we were doing through um, pictures, clearing the root area of weeds, exposing the roots and the root flare, pruning the adventitious roots, um, applying mulch, and then lastly watering. So this is a slide that was on the other um, presentation. So uh, we talked about taking a picture of the tree and then also um, making sure to just include somewhere in the picture, um, just to like write down the location or the address of the tree um, so we know where it was or is. Um, all right, and then second um, would be to clear the area of weeds. And then we talked about also using plastic tools when doing this as opposed to metal because the root area is quite delicate. And this is um, talks about like the dangers of weeds and how they cause the trees to fight for resources. And then um, also just to put the weeds in a pile um, so they'll be picked up by other volunteers. Um, and then this just talks more about the specifics of weeding and making sure you're pulling out the entire root system of the weed so it won't grow back. Mm -hmm. And then also just at any time, if anyone wants to say something, um, you can just talk too. I can't see everyone okay. through, so yeah, just say anything, it's totally fine. Um, and then we've talked about after this, um, the root flare will come into view and it's really important to expose this. Yeah, what we're finding is that um, the mulch has washed down over and we're getting adventitious roots. Mm -hmm. So that root flare one, that's a really nice picture, Kaylee. Mm -hmm. It's really showing that you've got to have that flare exposed. Um, I wanted to ask Jen, I sent this to you an email, but when you read this statement, does and also Rich, does this sound accurate? Uh, you want to hold on? I gotta get rid of myself here. There we go.
I don't know if um, weighed down by the soil is really accurate. It's more that it it just gets buried, so there's less access to oxygen. Yeah, I think that was also what Molly was talking about too, and changing the language. Yeah. yeah. Haley, did you get the um the revised version of this one that I sent you? Yeah, I did. I. I looked through the changes. I was comparing them, and I hope I got them all in. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I can um, change that language there because I think um, buried would be. That statement: the roots need to breathe. That's a good one. That's I think people understand that. You know, oh, okay. You know, we don't want to bury them underneath. That's do roots good. breathe? Do roots breathe through the like the thick part of the root, or only from the very tips? Well, I mean, technically they don't really breathe. I mean, if you're like well, biologically, but yeah. people understand that concept, you know, and can kind of visualize it. Um, but you just, mostly you, you want, I mean, all roots are taking in oxygen and mostly you want to have the entire, as much soil um, accessible to oxygen coming in and then you don't want to get into this in this particular situation but also those you want to be able for um, gas other gases to get out you know because exchange that can, yeah yeah you want the you want the whole exchange is exactly right so but the way down sounds like you're I mean, one of the biggest threats to urban trees is the compaction, mm -hmm. the way down. Well, well maybe we should maybe just say compacted instead of way down. Oh yeah, that's compacted. Yeah. If they are. Let me think. But you're putting you're putting mulch back on though, right? Yes, that comes later. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Should we go to? You the could next say one? if the roots will struggle oh. to get oxygen if they are under compacted soil. Mm. That way. Okay. I can make that change um, later. I'll do that. All right, and then uh, for the next step, it was pruning the adventitious roots, um, which is uh, pictured here too. And then we talk about the dangers of the adventitious roots because they can grow into girdle roots that encircle the trunk and then they can restrict the growth of the tree, which is that something that Molly helped me out with. I did um, send you a couple of other photos because in the email you requested. Yeah, yeah. I actually went out and took this picture just oh, okay, okay. It's on Bardwell Street. Okay. Where? Bardwell. Yeah, I got that email of the other pictures. I can add them. Um, oh, I can you, add them. you don't have to. I think just, this one's better because it's an actual tree and not yeah. in a pot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right, Molly. All right, and then for the next step, it was um, talking about adding mulch to the tree, which we do um, go in depth in the following slides. Um, so first we talk about how the values of mulch um, and why it should be used for trees, because it um, uh, supplies nutrients and as it breaks down uh, over the root system over time. And then- well, the, other, the other thing I would say about lawnmowers is even more than getting over the roots, it prevents them from um, hitting the bark, like mm. injuring bark, which is wow. really, really what kills trees, like string trimmers, wow. number one killer of trees. Maybe it prevents lawnmowers them. and string trimmers right. hmm, from um, damaging, or the what bark. was the word you use, Jen? Uh, I just said injuring the bark. Injuring, that's a good word. I think it's emotional. Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll make that change too. 
And then, so we talk about um, the proper way to mulch, um, spreading it at least three inches deep and keeping it um, three inches away from the root of uh, the trunk of the tree. And then we show um, the proper mulching here. And then I believe it's the next slide where we talk about improper mulching to show the uh, comparison. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ever, ever since I learned this, when I go on walks, I see so many trees where I pass by and I'm like, that's mulch strong. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, so we talk, so we show like, we have the clear picture showing what to do and what not to do. And then we talk about um, in the text here about the dangers of this volcano mulching too. I have to say one of my favorite things is that when you actually go and peel the, peel the mulch away, you actually realize that the flare is not too far underneath the mulch and they just have dug a little shallow holes and dumped them in there. Right? Oh. And, and left the wire basket and, mm -hmm. and the lacing all on it. Man, God. <laughs> really great. And then uh, next we get into watering a berm around the, uh, from the mulch um, to her watering the trees. And then we have like some details of that. It should be at least a foot away from the trunk and stand at least um, an inch taller. And I've noticed when we've been out, the um, trees that have had the mulch up against them, the bark is just disintegrated mm -hmm. all where the mulch has been touching it. So the idea of keeping it three inches away from that root flare and the tree. So you can really see how damaged the trees get. All right, and so then we have the next step we talk about um, watering is kind of exactly how to like test if the tree needs water. Um, talk about the, like how the dangers of overwatering too. And then I think we agree that like new trees, it's about five gallons every three to four days. Um, however, it kind of just depends on the size of the tree, but also how hot it is outside and how much rain um, we've been getting to. Instead of in the second bullet, I. I probably would use the word uh, less frequent, but more deep watering rather okay. than thorough. Okay. I just think from a, from a teaching point of view, I think people will understand that more because people always think they, you can drown a tree or any plant. Okay. All right. I'll change that too. And then here we kind of just show um, these containers because we talked about uh, before how it would be like five gallons every three to four days. And so uh, this white one is five gallons, the green watering can uh, is one gallon, and then these compost containers are five gallons just to give people a visual of the amount of water that the trees are. Wow, that's awesome. And then uh, we had this one slide, I think this is one of the last slides on water bags. Uh, when I met with um, Molly and David, we weren't sure if we should like keep this in because we weren't sure if we, the volunteers were the going to be the ones that were like tending to the water bags. Um, so I guess if anyone has any comments on this, they can see there. Rich, do you want people filling water bags? Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't mind if they fill water bags. I mean, I was in the last two weeks or three weeks. No, but um, I. Uh, I like this slide because I think it's important for people to lift up the water bag and kind of see what's going on underneath there. Okay. Uh, because we have my experience in the last couple of weeks, I've walked around and looked at some of these trees that we planted and have water bags on them. And what uh, Sue mentioned earlier about the bark being damp and wet and mm -hmm. um, sort of slimy, that's what's going on underneath these water bags right now. Mm -hmm. Oh. Rain. So I think it's, I think it's good. Um, and again, I, I, we've commented in some communities, they actually use two water bags and they put them on the stakes instead of actually putting them on huh. the stakes. But we don't no. stake every single tree. Yeah. Stake them if needed. Yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah, I think it, I think it's good to actually put that on there because you, you've got to lift it up to figure out what's going on underneath there. Mm -hmm. Have um, this, when it's really hot and humid and there's no rain in sight, you end up having a lot of... Um, uh, water, uh, sorry, um, rodent damage from uh, squirrels, mm -hmm. chipmunks, they drill, and mice, they drill holes in the bottom of a water bag. So you fill up a water bag, mm. and they're looking at it filling up, and it's coming out as fast as it's going in. So, yes, 
long short of it is yes, I think you should leave it. Okay. But should we add add some information about check the water bag for um, for rodent damage? Uh, yeah. You know, lift the bag to check for rodent damage and damage to the tree trunk. Yeah, okay. I, I think that's great. Yes. Please. Maybe not nesting, but chewing, chewing of the bags. Okay. Sure. Once in a while, the bags get stuck, and so I was just looking for the emails we send out from Tree Northampton sends emails during droughts about you know jiggling the water bag, checking the water bag, all that stuff. I'll see if I can find that. Um, a question: Do you need a hose to fill a water bag, or can you pour water directly into it from a bucket? Either. It's hard to do it with a bucket, though, right? Yeah. You could if you have a watering can with a spout, you could pull because oh. there's a little hole. Okay, I've never seen so there's a little hole in it. Okay, near the top, there's like oh. a little flap. Ah, oh. okay, I can move on to the next two slides. Um, yeah, so I think the next I would say six or seven slides are kind of slides you're kind of just recapping um, briefly what we just went over more in depth. So if you document the tree's condition, uh, clear the root area of weeds, expose the roots in the root flare, um, help the work, prune the adventitious roots, uh, apply mulch, and then water the trees. And then this last slide is just about uh, equipment to bring. And so we just had the gloves, weeding equipment, um, a camera to take a picture of the initial tree, and then a pen and a piece piece of paper, that should be paper, not water. <laughs> piece of water. <laughs> um, a pen and a piece of paper just to write down the address of the location of the tree. And then that was it for this presentation. Great. Uh, yeah, this is a question for the commissioners, but is it important to document the condition of the tree before taking these steps? I mean, can you think of how that baseline information might be used? Uh, I mean, the base, in my opinion, the baseline information would be used um, at this level, really, to determine whether if the tree was healthy, if the tree was dead, you know, if the tree was, you know, the condition of the tree. Um, but the question is, is that once you decide to document that, where you're going to put it? Right. <laughs> so, I mean, so that that's my like right now when when Rob and I. Um, we just talked today about some of the trees that died from last uh, last year that we planted um, that are on the watering list. And in the watering list we have, uh, when the staff goes out to water the trees, they note the tree is dead or it's in poor condition. And then I'll go and look at it and figure out what we have to do, whether we have to cut the main trunk out or we have to cut some broken leaders off or we have to pull it out of the ground. So there's got to be a way to, if you're going to do that, it's got to be a way to capture it, I guess. And, and place it somewhere. And that just means data entry by someone. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. It requires a person to be the one to do all that data, whether it's Rob or somebody on Tree Northampton or you. Right. And is it is it usable data or is it just not really that useful. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think what, what might be useful to be the most useful thing like for data uh, is the photographs. Oh. And the reason that is because I can load the photographs in the tree keeper. So you can have a photograph. Oh. The issue becomes that you have, you know, we have to enter all the, the trees in the tree keeper and then figure out which ones they are and uh, make sure they get the photos go to the right, uh, correct assigned um, hmm. identification number. So, would it be would it be um, easier or more efficient to um, when these maintenance crews are going out um, to have like little whiteboards that they when they're taking the picture of the tree it could have their address written on it and you just you know prop it up next to the tree so there's the tree and there's the address yeah yeah rather than having another place to write something down and then have to, I don't know how that information's collected, emailed or whatever, you know? Yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's good. 
That's what Kaylee was suggesting with a pen and paper, yeah. but I think a whiteboard and a marker is a better idea. I think with a whiteboard and a marker, it'll be like bigger. Yeah. Easier to see. Good idea. Yeah. I can see. I guess those two presentations were the ones that I was like mainly focusing on. Um, they're the most complete, I would say. Um, the other ones with the significant tree ordinance, um, the pollinator one and the Jackson Street School one, those are definitely more in progress. Um, just really nice, Kaylee, thank you. Yeah. Nicely done, thank you. Yeah, those are excellent. Just a quick time check, it's, we're about uh, 15 minutes off. Okay, well, I think we can make up the time Probably work underneath subgroup reports and to do list time or something. Um, does anyone have any questions for Kaylee? Any other questions about the presentations? Or? If there's time at the end of our meeting, um, maybe she could show the other slide presentation. Okay. The one on the right of way. Okay. I'm fine with that unless someone else has something, you know, I'm fine. Yeah. Um, again, thank you, Kaylee. Uh, so our next topic is the Main Street redesign. So I, I apologize, I, I didn't send the letter quick enough, but it took me a little while to get it all put together and drafted. And again, thank you for everyone's comments, everyone's uh, drafts, um, everyone's reread of, uh, so I, I mean, I do you, do you want me to, has, there, has everyone had a chance to read it? Yes. Okay, I, and I'm really looking for any comments, suggestions. I have. I have uh, on number two in the letter yep. down towards um, it's the sentences. Uh, I can't remember what the context was, but it was something like the end of the sentence is keep trees healthy or something like that. Uh, no, the end, number two, it says uh, it's soil volume and soil characteristics are directly correlated to a tree's health. I would put and longevity in there. Okay. Mm. Because that's pretty, that's pretty key. Like the difference between structural soil and putting trees in a tree pet is like tens of years. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be 40 year different or something like that. Okay. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Is, is this letter going to make any impact since it's so late? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they're they're at. I mean, I so basically to give you a quick update, what I've done so far is I have um, done a, a new uh, assessment of the condition of the trees um, on Main Street that exist. Mm. I provided that to the tool design, and I've been working with them to um, get, start working towards a twenty five percent design. So they really have to, we have to figure out what the condition of the trees are presently, um, which is helpful, but. Um, it also made me look at things a little, you know, Main Street, the trees on Main Street are in tough shape. Um, sometimes tougher shape than you recognize because we're just driving by them. Mm -hmm. We spend hours just walking around and looking and looking at the, the branch unions and the canopy and the trunks and how the flares are set um, and the root damage uh, and the hardscape that they are uh, up against. It's, um, it's really amazing. And I mean, most of the trees have like depressed crowns. It's just because they just don't have the rooting volume, or they've, they've, there is no rooting volume. So, um, and I gave them a, um, a inventory sheet. Actually, I did it over the phone with them. But um, so that's where I'm. That's as far as I have been. That's my last conversation last week with them. So, but I mean, I think it's really important to. You know, number three here was really important. I mean, it's all really super important, but number three was important because I think it's it's important to involve the myself as in my role as tree warden, but also the whole commission because I think it's important for people in the commission to actually look at the design and understand what the design is, have input on the design, the, the you know the species, um, the proposed planting locations, the soil substrate, um, and of course the construction. But you have to be closely monitored to ensure you know proper installation. So. And I, I, I was uh, originally wanting to put something in this document about maintenance, but I, I thought more about it 
And I don't think it's, I don't think it's the right time for that part. I think it's really just about the design and making sure that we get the design, you know, our once in a lifetime chance really, because it's once in our lifetime to get, right. it's about the design aspect of it. Um, and the maintenance I think is going to have to come uh, as the, as the designs progress and we actually know what, what we're actually going to be working with, how many, how many trees, the other green infrastructure is in there. And then I think the commission can write a whole letter about maintenance, because I think there really needs to be an emphasis on this because you, you cannot just build all this and then just walk away. It's not going to work. Right. So. I thought, I'm a little no, curious. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Go ahead. You can go, Sue. I was just said, I was just curious about, um, there was some discussion, I don't know um, where I came upon it, about other kinds of greenery. I was wondering about the competition for the tree roots, if there's an impulse to like plant a whole lot of stuff around the trees for nutrients and root, especially root space. And I also wanted to thank Jen for talking about the sidewalk to facade mm -hmm. need, because I subsequently went on um, the Cornell website and looked at the structural soil and across the board, they said, you have to have that. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have, that's an like important expertise that's been incorporated here. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, thank but you. about the extra greenery, does anybody know? Rich, do you know what they're planning on doing? No. With no. other plants? No, that, because I think they're, no, no. Sorry, no and no and no. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and, no, I, and I think because of the, I think we, they have we have to figure out exactly what tre what trees on Main Street actually can gain and actually not be interrupted by construction and what cannot. And then depending upon um, what that looks like and how it fits in with the other um, uh, hardscape structures like the the, uh, the bike path, the bike path, the bicycle path the different uh, parking shapes, the different pedestrian um, um, refuges that are gonna be there. I think that's gonna depend upon how much plant material is there. I think the other thing too, is it may depend upon what type of um, substrate they use. So reasons I, I didn't wanna just mention CU soil is because there's also the silva, silva cell concept. So depending upon which one is used, um, what I think the ones that are whatever is used got to benefit the city in a, um, in a better way um, to actually get more more greenery and more canopy. And if that means you know it's a mix and match, then so be it. You know. Um, I thought the cells were really um, expensive. I mean, so structural soil is, but are the cells? Yeah, Jen. Jen, Jen. Um, a couple things. I. The one about the greenery, extra greenery, um, is uh, usually the planting plans follow, you know, so you just have to, I'm really glad, Rich particularly, and we are asking to be involved in the process because often, you know, the gray infrastructure is what they go for. Okay, this is what we're doing. And they like, you know, kind of, okay, here's the planting plans and here's the specs for the plants. and often those specs are really old, they're out of date, they're not even, you know, current mm -hmm. planting uh, um, knowledge, you know, um, because they're stored on their computers and we're putting them in there. Okay, we got to get this done. So, so that's that. But I think they were also talking about possibly having some curb cuts with, um, with, uh, you know, some type of water holding capacity that weren't trees, like a, somewhere in the discussions that was mentioned. I don't know if that's gonna come to fruition. The third thing is, it seems to me to be extremely popular right now in landscape architecture to underplant the daylights out of everything. <laughs> and um, that I, I dealt with Rich on some stuff about Prospect Street too. I'm not Prospect, um, yeah, Pleasant. Pros Pleasant, thank you. You know they were trying to do that there too, and um, I think we got the message that you know urban street trees are under a lot of stress anyway, and I think you're absolutely right, Sue. I would never recommend underplanting, mm -hmm. and often 
either the trees die or the underplanting stuff dies. So, and you can't water it properly. And it's just, it's just not, if we lived in, you know, Vail, Colorado or something like that, <laughs> you know, the, 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 you know, the community has millions of dollars to, you know, to maintain stuff. And, you know, I mean, they don't have water anymore, but that's a different issue. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so that's, that's the underplanting and the, so I think we just have to try to be vigilant about it and keep, you know, gently reminding and pushing that, you know, the health of growing the trees is really where it's at. Um, I do have some experience with um, both CU soil. I really like number three, Rich, because having somebody on the site overseeing the job is critical. It's yeah. absolutely critical because many times you'll get people to bid the job. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, we can do it. But they've never worked with CU soil. And there's very specific things, the way it has to be done. It's very specific. And um, I, we had plans at my place I used to work. I designed this whole thing and I was not on the job over the summer. They put it in and they put in CU so, uh, structural soil. There's a lot of different kinds of structural soil and it was kind of like cement. So the trees never even went in, you know? We also had those silver blocks, those plastic things. And I won't take a lot of time up in the meeting right now talking about that, but they are very expensive. And um, I think there's some pluses and minuses to them that I'd be happy to talk about, but I, I'll let somebody else talk. Um. Following what you just said, Jen, maybe in the letter it should say, um, should be monitored, not just should be monitored, but should be monitored by the tree warden or a certified arborist. Not I just the landscaping company boss. Right, no, I, I think uh, I think what's, you know, most um, construction documents of this size, they have all those types of things noted actually on the construction documents. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think we need to, I don't think we need to add that to that part, of, but it's duly noted because I totally agree with you. It's gonna, that's a huge construction footprint. I mean, it's not like we're just planting one tree and building one short piece of sidewalk or doing a short piece of roadway right. infrastructure where, where, you know, where it's, um, it's like Pulaski Park on, you know, in essence, but in a much longer sense, so. Um, but I mean, just from an economic point of view, if they're going to shell out the money for this, um, you know, for these load bearing air, soils, they're extremely pricey. And the idea of having it put in wrong, you know, not properly installed is just heartbreaking as a taxpayer mm -hmm. and a tree lover because you won't have trees and you'll spend a whole lot of money. Yep. Agreed. Does, does anyone else have any comments? Marilyn, we haven't heard from you. How are you doing over there? Oh, pretty good. I'm not sure if this is a good time to bring it up, but um, today when I was uh, walking from mm -hmm. downtown, um, I noticed they are redoing the parking lot yeah. behind Pulaski Park in this two trees that they kept but they're not protected i took photos of them okay. and was wondering if somebody might be able to protect them yep can you can you send me the photos please yeah i'll do that right now they're still on my phone all right thank you we all have to do that all the time yeah i saw that too marilyn and one of them that they kept the whole middle of the crown is dead i, I looked at that thing i was like what yeah point you know they're already kind of hanging by a thread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think some of those trees, when, when we went down and did a site visit, and we're just off topic for a second here, um, those trees weren't leafed out. Yeah. Well, but now they're leafed out, maybe we have to do something differently. But if you could send me the pictures, that would be really helpful. Um, is part of that plan, I know, oh my gosh, time is kind of a blur. A couple of years ago, when we were um, scoping out the EJ sections of town, for our grant, did it include that parking lot? No. Are, are they planning to plant some trees in like islands there? Um, yes, they are. Um, and I'll, 
And the reason that it's limited though, because that um, site is a, um, was remediated by um, Eversource, well, Columbia Gas, because that's where the uh, gas, coal gasification used to happen. So there's uh, soil there that is, um, basically there's, a, there's like a permeable, not a per, non-permeable rubber liner about 36 inches down underneath the blacktop. So we plant anywhere near there because of the potential penetration of tree roots. It's a brownfield site. Yes. So at, oh. as, when you start at the Pulaski Park and you work, you walk your way out towards the wood line, towards the McDonald House, the, um, it goes down at an angle. So it's 36 inches at the Pulaski Park sidewalk. And as you go farther out into the parking lot, it tapers uh, downward so it's deep. So that end of the parking area will have more trees planted. Mm -hmm. Before we go off topic any further, just does anyone have any? Marilyn, I'm sorry, I don't mean to. I don't know if you have more questions. Oh no, that's it. I, I just texted you those photos. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any comments about the letter? Uh, I just have one question about the letter, Rich. It's, so, yes. if uh, under the continuous canopy plan, how many trees would be planted versus alternative three without continuous canopy? That's actually a good question. So, I mean, the way that I looked at the, and again, it's conceptual, right? So you see the conceptual green dots on this plan and, and you see that there's a, a several holes in them. Uh, for example, uh, between, um, between City Hall and um, Memorial Hall, mm -hmm. there's absolutely no trees there. There's no trees in front of Edwards Church. It's consistent. Um, there's no trees. There, there are some trees going up Elm Street on the right-hand side by St. Mary's. Um, but coming down on the other side, there, there's only three trees, which are bald cypress, right in front of the Smith College Administration Building. And there's another hole right there, as people kind of come down the hill and go around the corner. So, I mean, I, to be honest with you, David, I didn't count the, the proposed trees. But, I mean, I think part of this whole process is like, you know, maybe we, the spacing of the trees is important. So, you know, if we pick trees that are a medium growth tree, a medium sized tree versus a large tree, like a hundred or 80 footer to 110. And one is between like a 40 and a 65 foot tree. Then we can actually squeeze the growing space closer. We can actually have more trees and actually more of a canopy, a thick canopy um, without actually having the branches really interfere with each other to the point where you have to do a lot of reduction pruning, reduction cuts. So, you know, I, I guess I, I guess we have to kind of see the 25% design or in the 25% design and process. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not going to be waiting until December. I'm going to be right at the table when they're actually putting this design together before the 25% design is unrolled. And you, have, you will as well. So we'll see. We'll actually see where the holes are. And we'll actually be able to try to hopefully find a way to try to fill those, fill those gaps. I, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. No, it's it's helpful. And then just one final question is, you know, Doug Tallamy recommends planting like a kind of three trees because when they're young, so their roots interlock and they're less, they're more resistant to blowdowns. No, is that is that something we should be thinking about as a thinking about recommending? I mean, I, I don't know enough about it, but uh, Jen, you might or. Well, uh, I don't know who Doug Tallamy is. Uh, uh, Rich. Put me on to him. He's a how would you describe him, Rich? He's a forester, a scientist. He's a he's a he's a long long time professor. University of Delaware. Thank you. I was kidding. <laughs> and, he's written uh, a lot. He's written various books. He's a he's a great publicist. He's he widely great. read by a general audience. Yeah, yeah. He does get attacked for not being scientific sometimes, but he inspires incredible passion amongst people. And his his recent work is on the oak, and yeah, all the that's amazing that's benefits of the oak. Yes. Yep. Super popular. He's an entomologist by training. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, he's yeah. I don't know about urban trees. Does anybody know about like? Well, I mean, I think I mean I think you know tree roots and tree belts graft themselves together all the time. It's, uh, it's just how it happens because of they have to share the same um, soil space. So I don't, I don't think that, uh, I think this will be the same case. I think if they have continuous types of 
um, uh, soil substrate that actually allows that these tree roots would be tied together. And again, depending upon this, the location of where the planting is and the species we pick or the tree size that we pick, the closer together they are, I think the better off that we're gonna be. And, and the quicker the canopy is gonna fill in. That's the other thing too, is that mm -hmm. we're talking about potentially a lot of trees being taken down that are they're pretty sizable and are doing have a lot of benefits and are are uh, providing shade and and making Northampton really walkable and environmentally friendly. And now we're gonna you know we're gonna go through a process and change all that, mm -hmm. trying to tie things together more quickly and closer um, by picking the correct species is is I think a, a a really good thing to look at. So I would say yes, David. I think it would be good to and that's why I think the spacing. You know, when people say, well, we're going to plant trees 50 feet apart, I'm like, well, you know, 50 feet apart is great, but it takes about another 10 or 20 years to get the trees to actually touch each other and actually really make, um, you know, a, a screen or a, a true shaded street. So, anyway, it's just my random thought. So, does, does anyone else have any questions or comments? No, I think it's a great letter. Well, thank you. I mean, it's a lot of input from everyone. And I just kind of assemble, I try to assemble it all. Um, thank you, Rich, for finishing it off. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so what I would like to do is, I'm not exactly sure um, how, I mean, I think this is more of a statement, but I don't know if it's, I, I'm not sure who we're going to address it to. So that's another question. So um, the last time we wrote a letter from the commission as a whole, we, we addressed it to the mayor was regarding uh, zoning changes that were in front of the city council. So um, I, I would like to address it to some one or some body, not, not some body like, you know, like a body, like a municipal body, or just have it our statement about our thoughts about the main street design. So, um, I guess anybody have any thoughts on that? And I know we're like really, we're really, we really have those stressed on time here. But well, what about the planning planning department? Aren't they the ones who implement it all? Yeah, I mean the plan the planning department is working with Tool, but there's a whole bunch of us as stakeholders, like myself, the city engineer. Um, you know, so there's a whole bunch of different people that are primary stakeholders. Um, but I, I think it would be. I haven't quite figured out how to address. I mean, I like it because I think it's a statement. It's our statement and I, everyone should read this statement because we will have continuous statements, I think, about this project as we move forward through the design process. Um, so we could, uh, we, could, you know, we could address it, dear, dear fellow city residents, boards and commissions or something of that nature. Yeah, how about, how about addressing it to the mayor and then have some statement that, as you suggested, Rich, wraps in all other uh, stakeholders that we want this letter to be in front of. Okay. And, okay. Um, would it be does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Well, how are we going to distribute it out? Like, let's say it's going to city councilors and, um, the planning, different people in the planning department, and so it, it would. I, I would, if I were to do that, I would send this out to all the stakeholders. Okay. I'd actually, request that this thing be somehow posted if they are putting letters or participate um, other support letters on the city's website. Um, I haven't seen anything on the actual Main Street redesign website itself. Um, it's just been really more of like technical data. I probably looked at all that, but. Um, so, I mean, it would go to like the, the clerk of the city council, it would go to the city councilors, it would go to the mayor, planning, the planning department, um, to, uh, to transportation and parking. It's another group of folks like, like us um, that it should go to. And then um, it would be good to have this out somewhere so the other stakeholders, like people that actually work, live, um, and um, utilize Main Street get to see it. So I'm not sure how we get to that part, but... Mm. I can get the first half done. Could we give it to uh, the Chamber of Commerce? Yeah, I mean, it's a public document. We can give it to anyone that we like. 
I'm thinking as far as getting trying to get it to yeah I mean I we could uh the downtown DNA, people the DNA might be a place we could actually give it um could you just address it to Mayor Narkowitz and stakeholders or something like that? I mean, well, we could. I mean, I mean, if you're willing to, if you're willing to just take a take a vote, at least on the context of the letter, and then allow me to find uh, as, the, as the chair for the rest of for the rest of the commission to finalize how it gets addressed. That would, be, that would be helpful because I don't want to I don't want to hold this up. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that the commission votes to approve the wording of the letter that's been presented and allow Rich to finalize the salutation content um, to include um, stakeholders. I second. Any, any uh, discussion? And to distribute it and to not just the salutation, but also the distribution of the letter. So I amend that and make a motion to um, that we approve the text of the letter, the body of the letter as written, and to um, give pa give our ex officio chair the um, discretion to create the salutation and distribute the letter. Is that capture, Molly? Yeah, sure. Now we need a second. Second. Okay. <laughs> Any discussion on the motion? Okay, roll call vote. Uh, yeah, please, if you wouldn't mind. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, good. Sorry, my husband's out mowing. Um, Rich? Yes. Susan? Yes. Jen? Yes. Molly? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. And David? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So just a time check, we have roughly 20 more minutes until six. Okay, so um, quickly, the remaining summer meeting schedule. So uh, the Doodle poll indicates that uh, everyone, we can have a quorum for the first meeting in, in August. Um, and if everyone is still good with that, I'll make our meeting in um, August. Uh, let me just get my calendar. With that Fourth. Up. Thank you, August 4th, yes. Um, the 18th, which is, I'm gonna be on vacation. And I think Sue has also indicated she will not be here. So if you're okay with not having that meeting, it would be okay with me. And then we would reconvene uh, the first Wednesday of September. Is the 4th gonna be remote or I'm in Zoom? Yes. Okay, good. Cause I will, might be, I'm probably gonna be out of town but I can do Zoom. Okay. Yep. Um, and then um, let me just find my hold on a second. Um, so I, I mean, I can we can talk about the Zoom aspect of meetings and meeting in person and all that at our at our next meeting. I won't belabor that at this point. But I really want to hear Molly's spotted lantern fly read because it's only been tabled like for three meetings. Okay. So Let's get through it. You want? So I just want. I'm just gonna. Oh. Say, no, I just want the sub oh. report. Jen and Rob and I met to talk about the wood bank. Um, I have a set of minutes I have to put together. It was very brief. Um, and we we don't we don't really have, um, we're just trying to, in the discovery phase of trying to figure out different aspects of what to do um, with the wood bank by reaching out to different places that either have wood banks um, and um, how to actually maybe possibly use the material to turn it into biochar and also find out uh, the possibility of people that actually would like to use it for woodworking projects or wood sawing, things of that nature. And I'm not gonna say any more about it because I haven't, I haven't really done any other homework on it since. Sorry, Jen. <laughs> uh, Neither. Um, and anyone else, has anyone else met? I don't think so because no one has been in contact with me. So if you are wanting to meet with your subgroup, please let me know and I can do the agenda for you and get a Zoom link up and ready and you can meet away if you want. Um, Jen, Rob and I are gonna meet at some point, I hope soon to talk about um, the, the tree list and planting guidelines and is someone else on that group? I can't remember, I'm sorry, I don't have I it. think it's just the three of us, but I, I did email 
Rob and Rich and got a list, like compiling a list of items to think about changing or amending. Okay. Um, any other comments about that? All right, Molly, it's all yours. All right, so let me share a screen. Yep, um, sorry, hold on one second. Okay, you should be up and running. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is just a quick informal thing. So this is a spotted lanternfly. Um, you're seeing the nymphs in various stages and the adults. Nymphs on top, adults on the bottom. Um, this is what can happen. They can become extremely numerous. Um, they can just coat, coat surfaces and the adults excrete a, a honeydew type substance that uh, rains down on anything below it and causes a black sooty mold to grow. Uh, as well as killing the trees. But um, this is a map uh, as of March in 2021 showing uh, how far they had gotten so far. Um, you can see they haven't reached Massachusetts as of that point, but it's, it's spreading fairly rapidly. So I, I think it's just a matter of time before they get here. Um, the little dots um, like here and here are there are actually individual infestations, but no widespread infestation yet. It started in Pennsylvania and is radiating out. Okay, so both the nymphs and the adults are um, harmful to plants. Um, both of them eat um, the nymphs I'm not sure if they actually chew on stuff or, or um, drink the sap, but the adults um, drink the sap. And these are the foods that they like to eat um, in particular. So tree of heaven mm -hmm. is one of the main, you know, is a food uh, both the nymphs and the adults use, but so also is black walnut. Um, this plant Styrax, which is this. I don't think we have any of those in Northampton that I know of. Private property. That could be, yeah. Um, those three yeah. are the ones that are used by both. Oh, actually, and grapes too. Grapes, unfortunately, because I grow some grapes in my yard. Um, both nymphs and adults will use and feed on the grapes. Um, they kill They kill the trees? They, they can, yes. Here it says, it doesn't generally kill plants other than the preferred hosts. So the tree of heaven and the grapes, it can kill those and small saplings. So I think the tree of heavens are blooming right now. Mm. This would be a really good time to go out and identify them. I'll I get to I that. Saw okay. some, um, if you go down, like you're going to the airport, but you take a right into the meadow, uh -huh. it's a hedgerow with a whole bunch. Okay, all right. That's good. So like behind the fairgrounds? Behind the fairgrounds, instead of going straight under the bridge to the uh -huh. airport, Turn right. take a right into the meadow, uh -huh. go down there, I don't know, 100 yards, and I think there's a big hedgerow of them. You think they're not sumacs? I don't think so. I think they had these flowers you're showing. Okay. Well, that'll be again. one of the things that will follow from this presentation is eventually identifying where the Elanthus trees are in the city. Um, so this just this just lists a few other hosts, um, and whether the adults or the larvae um, both use it. Okay, so um, tree of heaven is is known as Elanthus altissima. It's a non-native and also invasive um, tree, first introduced in Philadelphia. Uh, it has extensive roots and it grows from suckers. Um, so it's, there's no harm in getting rid of that tree. <laughs> um, so to try to control spotted lanternfly, the best way is to eliminate the preferred host plants.
but obviously we can't get rid of all the tree of heavens, all the grapes, all the um, black, walnuts. black walnuts for heaven's sakes. Um, so that's not really possible. Um, as far as physical or mechanical, you know, there is destroying eggs. You can use a sticky band um, around trees, but you have to protect the sticky band with netting so that birds don't get stuck on it. Mm. Um, and there are these things called circle traps that can capture them. But those methods really only capture a small percentage of, of, the, of the insects. Um, there are some testing of biological controls, but they're not really going yet. And then, um, so for chemical, it leaves chemical as the only really way to go. Um, there are these things like soaps, oils, neem and pyrethrins um, can be used, but they're really not that effective. Um, and unfortunately, really the only effective pesticide is Dinota furan, but it is a neonicotinoid. Mm. Um, so it's, it's a bad situation. Um, these are the different ways that you can apply it, whatever you're going to apply. If, if, if you're going to use this method, this is how you could do it. Um, starting in order of um, least um, duration up to the most duration. So there's foliar application, bark application, injection, and soil drench. Um, this lists a few of, you know, uh, all the different you know, types of treatments that you can do. Down at the bottom, it lists some of these ones here that are, you know, not as effective. Um, they might do a little bit at the beginning, but residually, um, it doesn't last very long. The only ones that last a long time are, are these two. Um, those are contact insecticides. And then, um, I don't actually know much about these two. Can you say them? Because I can't see them. Um, let me try to improve the view here. Let's see. Go to presentation. Like, uh, there. there um, let's see, what does that say? By, by fenthrin, I think? By dentrin? I don't know. Abetocyfluthrin. Um, not too toxic, well, somewhat toxic to birds, but yes, toxic to bees. Those might be neonicotinoids too. Um, and the systemic ones are the ones that go actually into the tree, um, are absorbed by the tree. And this is the one that's the most effective one, but um, you know, it's a neonicotinoid, so that's not good. Um, so this sort of just shows, I'm gonna go back to another smaller. Oops, okay, let's do this. Um, what this basically shows is that um, if it's whatever application is done at this time, um, this is the mortality using these different methods and then it tapers off. It shows that they all taper off after a certain amount of time. Um, but the one that lasts you know, somewhat longer is the dino to furin in the, the green line. So the, the bottom line is that this, it's really important to be proactive when dealing with spotted lanternfly, which is why I'm bringing it up now before we have it up here in Massachusetts. Um, the best thing to do is, first of all, identify all the Alanthus um, that we can and try to kill um, most of them using, um, make gashes in the trunk and spray a systemic herbicide into the gashes but keep a few remaining that are gonna be trap trees. And um, when the spotted lanternfly comes to those trees, um, use a soil drench of this chemical um, to kill the spotted lanternfly in large quantities when they feed on it. Um, I don't know what to do about grapes and black walnuts, but I think I've heard that, you know, Alanthus is really the most favorite um, plant. So, maybe we could make a dent in it um, by, by doing this method. Um, I don't know, you know, if people have Alanthus growing in their backyards, you know, we, we might have to do some education about this, but anyway, that's the presentation we can discuss at some point 
what we want to, um, how we want to proceed about that. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. A, a quick question. In your uh, research, did you find, uh, does the state, uh, and I haven't looked myself, does the state have a program um, like a, 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 that actually addresses this and how, mm. I know that the, the, it's not like Asian longhorn beetle or emerald ash borer. It's not here yet. Yeah. You know, it's been identified in a little pocket in, in Northern Connecticut um, in, in New York, but I'm wondering if they I don't remember. I'll check and find out. Okay, that that would be that would be interesting because I like to see what they, because sometimes what happens I know like for uh, Asian longhorn beetle if we have Asian longhorn beetle here, basically the state comes in with the through the federal government and they just take over everything. And they just, right. But, but the thing about um, being proactive is you have to do it before they get there. You know you have to you know cut down a lot of those elanthus before they arrive. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. Anyway, I'll check and see if there's a state program. Um, a lot of that information, by the way, comes from the um, University of Pennsylvania. Um, they have a lot of resources about spotted lanternfly, their extension service. I think it's Penn State. University. Oh, Penn State. You're right. You're right. Penn State. Thanks, yeah. Jane. Yeah, sure. The Commonwealth just has two buttons. They say fruit trees, too. Hmm. Grapevines, hops, and fruit trees. Yeah, well, grapevines, hops, not many people have hops, so that's a minor problem. And then it says, think you've spotted it, reported here, and then they have facts, fact sheet. Yeah. It doesn't, it sounds like they're, they're in the stage of just uh, collecting data about when it arrives and where, but that they don't have anything in place. For they have a form to fill out. Dealing with it. You think you've seen it. Yeah. Is there anybody's name associated with it for more information? Fact sheet, let's see. <clears throat> MDAR, Massachusetts Inter Yeah, the whole UMass Extension. Oh, well, I could try calling. I'll call UMass Extension and see if they know anything more about um, actual programs that are ready to be uh, activated if there is Mass, no. Mass, the Massachusetts Introduced Pests Outreach Project is a collaboration between the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources and the UMass Extension Agricultural Landscape Program. Can you send me that link, that website? Yeah. Great. I'll follow up on that. I know that Tawny Samiski is the new entomologist at uh, UMass. I don't know if, if she's dealing with Spider and lantern fly, but how do you spell that name? It's T A W N E Y, and I think it's well, I'm bad spelled. S S I M I S K Y is my guess. It'll probably correct. Okay. <laughs> she's with Extension. Know. Yeah, she's a new entomologist. She's only been there a couple of years. Okay, great. I'll follow up on this. Yeah, I've seen some. Uh, you know, little video clips and some other stuff that she's done. So, thank you very much. That's it's nice to actually have a little educational piece. Right. right. I don't think we do enough. Um, and even all the stuff that I read and all the different emails I get with these. Yeah. It's nice to have. Uh, it's nice to have someone else actually telling me what <laughs> to know about. And I really appreciate it. Synthesize the information. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, do we have time for Kaylee's other show? Oh, not really. Maybe there's a place people could go to look at it, though. Yeah, I can uh, email it. I can email both of them, or I can put it in the um, Google Drive, too. And yeah, if anyone like wants to meet to talk about it or just email me with comments or suggestions, that's also fine. Too. OK. Um, Kaylee, you're. Kaylee said that um, when she talked with me and David that um, she wasn't going to be able to stay past August 1st. Yeah, it was my understanding that the internship ended on the 30th, which is what the uh, letter um, initially said at the beginning. The letter, the letter that we wrote or the letter from your school? Uh, the letter that you gave me. At that you emailed me at the beginning. Um, letters beginning. can letters can always be changed. How long do you want to stay for? <laughs> well, 
I mean, no, I'm just, I'm not, I mean, I, the, that's the internship period, but that doesn't mean it can't be extended if you so choose to want to do it, or if it's a, also, it's a, would be a benefit for us, I think, but the question is, is it a benefit for you? Um, and I can't. Yeah, I think I know I'd have to look um, exactly at my calendar because I am a little busy, at least midway through August, so I'm going to be going away. So, okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, I leave school. Send, us an email or send me an email and just just let me know your thoughts. I, I will get back to you, I promise, even though I didn't respond today. I'm sorry. Today's not over yet, though. <laughs> Since our next meeting is <laughs> August 4th, um, do you think you'll be around till then, Kaylee? Maybe we could have a final um, something August 4th. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I, I should be around um, then. I'll email you, Rich, tomorrow and let okay. you know my availability. All right. All right. Thank you very much. And um, I do uh, the to do list. I, I haven't been able to find the original to do list we had the last time we had it on the back of one of our um, either agendas or minutes. I have to try to find that to do list. And I haven't been able to find it. And I haven't had the time to be totally honest with you. Did we have a to do list or were we just using the, the um, Google spreadsheet that listed what people had signed up for? Uh, well, Marilyn had expressed uh, at the last meeting we had to, if we could actually try to pull up the to-do list and at least we could all just kind of take a look at it. I think, right, Marilyn, you correct me if I'm wrong. I, I can't remember. I can't remember it was so long. <laughs> yeah, we, we did away with the Google spreadsheet uh, quite some time ago. So what, what I recall we've been doing is um, in the minutes, because at the end of every meeting, when we go around and just say our to-dos, they're being captured in the minutes. And, and that's been our, our record. But we don't we no longer have the like the Google Drive spreadsheet. That uh, wait, that's not the spreadsheet I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one that we use to prioritize what we were going to do this year. And where people, you know, there's columns for each person and they signed up for which yeah. which activity they're going to do and which group their subgroup they're heading up. Yes, that, that's correct. We used to have, originally we had a spreadsheet that had the to-do list. It's kind of what we all worked off of independently. And so we have, we have our um, subgroup list that you're referring to, Molly, but Marilyn, I think, was referring to. Um, I, I think we need further discussion about what we'd like to do with that to-do list because there are things that we do do that maybe be beneficial to have a short list on the back and I don't want to overload people either. So I, I mean, I, and I obviously we can't discuss it all tonight, but um, it would be, it would be good to, let me find that list and I'll just float it around before our next meeting. Um, even if it's a scan of an old set of minutes, I'll have to find, because you don't have access to the old minutes in the, in the heart and the drive, which we have, because I don't have them loaded in there. So and we can make it an agenda item. If, uh, that I, think I sent around, I, Molly, I took your goals list and I took all the point people and made a list and I sent it to everybody. These are your, your to do, your to do's basically. Oh, um, I'll see if I can find that email. Like if your name is bald, you're the point person. If anyone wants to, if anyone wants to meet in the, the as a subgroup before our next meeting, just let me know, and I will set up a Zoom link for you and do a, an agenda. And Sue will resend that email with that, um, what she was just talking about, what actually just kind of reminds everybody what what we're trying, what we're all kind of working on. All right. Does anybody have anything anything else before? Oh, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, the discussion you were having about underplantings, I just wanted to mention, I, I noticed some today on Bridge Road, um, kind of near JFK, there's extensive underplantings that I think the neighbors have done um, in the tree belt underneath some, underneath every single tree, there's like a huge clump of hosta yep. and other stuff. And um, it didn't occur to me before, but now that you mention it, I don't know if those are competing with the trees or or what? Yeah, that, so that, I'm sorry, go ahead. I had my head down. Who was going to say? When we're weeding trees, I mean, we pulled out weeds, like people have planted, I don't know what they 
I don't know what they were, some of them, but just enormous plant, like roots, like thick, long, right next to our urban street tree. Mm -hmm. And we've talked to them. It's kind of awkward because they think it's beautiful. Yeah. And they, they're caring, you know, they're trying to do something good. And right. here they are, like, it is beautiful. Tree. Yeah. And so um, we pulled out some really doozies, real doozies. Um, lilies, all kinds of stuff they're putting around the roots. Yeah. Check out these hostas. Bridge Road, you said? Yeah. Well, that, that's a whole nother, that's a really a, like a whole nother topic because people are transforming tree belts and pollinating. Um, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Right. But I, I, I actually need to, to work with Donna and we had Donna and I have talked about this, we just haven't had the time to develop a policy um, in regards to that because people can't alter the public right away without a, without a mm -hmm. DPW and actually about trench permit, it's stated. Um, and it's actually, yeah. City ordinance. So, I mean, that actually would be something that would be really helpful if we had the bandwidth to wrap our heads around. It would be helpful to me, anyways, and to other people to actually have a policy. Let's it put that on our next agenda. Yeah, I, I, I can do so if you'd like. Yeah. So, I just resent that email about um, it was in response to Marilyn talk, we were talking about the to do, and then we had that goals spreadsheet with the green. So um, I went through the goal spreadsheet sheet to create a kind of to-do <laughs> with each person's name. So it should be in your email by now. I just sent it and it's, you know, about the work that we've identified as our priorities that we want to do and where our minds should, you know, where our efforts should be focused since we've agreed on these priorities, that that's the first movement forward we should be mm -hmm. doing. Those are our goals and our priorities that we've chosen. Great. That's good. I'm looking at it. That's very good. Thank you. Because I know people don't always like remember the link to the shared. You know, if you go to your Google and you look at shared, you can work your way into those that goal sheet. But I know people don't necessarily do it. So I thought that might be helpful. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other business? I know we're a little over time. Marilyn, thanks for hanging in there. Thank you. Does, does anyone have any other business you want to bring up? So we'll see everyone August 4th, unless I hear from someone between now and then. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? I'll move to adjourn the meeting. Uh, make a second. I'll, I'll second that. Uh, okay, no discussion. Uh, just raise hands during the meeting. All in favor? Yes, dead. Here we are. Thank you, guys. Sorry about the delay. I had computer issues early. No, that's all right, Deb. We'll connect. We'll connect. Bye. Oh, no, I'll fill you in on the first part of the meeting. Um, Bye. Bye, Marilyn. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Thanks, everybody, for Thanks. all your work. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Molly. Yeah. Okay. Bye. All right.